Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, it's midday Friday, and normally I bring these to you on Thursday evening, but uh, this was what caused a lot of delays for me. So I'm just showing you last night here on Thursday night uh, some of the snow that came through parts of the front range of the Rocky Mountains. And I was kind of tucked right in here uh, at the Denver airport, and that snow squall right there just uh, kind of shut us down for about three hours. And so I didn't get home till quite late. So I just decided to get a little bit of rest and then try to uh, give you a better outlook for today. Now, if you saw my morning uh, video, the, the morning minute, I covered all of the kind of immediate stuff that's going on. So we're just going to focus in this video on the longer range. So let's get right into it. The first thing I want to talk about here is <clears throat> when we looked at the height of this uh, fall drought, I think it prob probably reached its peak uh, in terms of its uh, the flash drought aspect of it on the 20th of October. So we're going back to that map. And again, uh, this really hit the Mississippi uh, watershed pretty hard. And this, of course, was still when we were very hot and dry in the Pacific Northwest. Now, since then, this is what the, the map looks like. And uh, I'll be heading out to Montana next week. So I'm actually very curious if any of you want to leave a comment for me. You know, when we look at how much precipitation's come into Montana, it, it shows up very wet uh, recently over the last 14 weeks, or excuse me, 14 days, two weeks. Um, we're way off the, the scale here uh, at total precipitation. But Montana spent much of it, pockets of Montana spent much of this year uh, in, in significant drought. So I'm just looking at all of this and trying to blend it together. So on the 20th, this is the latest, the November 4th soil moisture map. And again, we continue to see the upper Midwest, parts of the plains and, and, and the central plains, especially showing up very dry. The, the rainfalls kind of come in this corridor and through here. So you can kind of see it right there. Now, we've missed out on precip in the eastern Corn Belt to the northeast. The southeast in pockets has been very dry. We have storms that are coming over the lower Mississippi River Valley today, which are going to add to this. But unfortunately, the rains we saw this morning and throughout the rest of the day are staying you know, central Kansas east rather than delivering some of that moisture back farther to the west. Also, major changes coming for the uh, western United States going to really start to fill in some of these uh, drier gaps here. Now, uh, yesterday morning, we did have the new drought monitor that was released, and I want to just talk about it because I had anticipated the drought monitor, the total area shrinking a little bit. But when we came in here and looked at uh, the time series, we can actually see here that total drought area jumped up again. So when you look at all stages, D0 to D4, we now have 85.3% uh, uh, in some stage of drought. And I was kind of curious where that drought area kind of increased because, as I said, lately we've had better rain that's come through here, and that's been an area that's been drier. So I'm going to come back over here to the maps tab and go down to change maps and just kind of show you what changed in the last week. So the drought deepened in the Dakotas, pockets of Minnesota, and then in this part of the winter wheat belt. But it was a lot of increased drought. Uh, showing up over here in the east. So we can see it in the Carolinas, Virginia, back down to Florida. The improvements were right in through here where the rain did come through. So overall, we had more of a area that saw degradation than we saw improvement. So again, some of my big questions from now going forward are going to be, will this drop picture continue to look like this uh, into the foreseeable future? And I Last week, I thought it had reached a peak, and I, I think that um, as we go forward, we're going to see drought area shrinking in the central United States and in the west, but m might possibly be expanding down here over the southeast. Here's a big picture over the next uh, couple of weeks. So we have a very uh, unsettled week for the next at least six to seven days for the Pacific Northwest through California. Multiple lows are coming through. Uh, one today is ejecting through the Canadian Prairie. We have another one down here today that's coming out of the lower Mississippi, or excuse me, um, the Red River Valley coming out of the Southern Plains. And it's going to go through the Midwest, and that's one of the reasons why you see so much wet uh, weather here. Uh, we then have, uh, going into the weekend, more systems diving into the, the west, and they're going to eject likely more of a northerly trajectory. I'm watching one that could be about nine days from now that could come back into the into the picture here and possibly deliver some snow, but it's it's just a little bit too early to kind of to talk about. But I'm, I'm bringing that up to show you where I expect improvement in that drought monitor and where we see problems maybe arising. So maybe parts of the Tennessee Valley, the southeast, getting over here into the eastern United States. And what I'll be watching for uh, late this weekend and then getting into next week is will this upper level low that's sitting here north of the Bahamas actually deliver this moisture into parts of the east coast? We've been kind of trying to keep an eye on that. Now, a lot of what's coming into the West will be snow, as we talked about this morning. So I just want to show you kind of a sequence of maps from the European Ensemble. The first map here shows you the probability of getting an inch of snow in the next 10 days. And just to make a point, uh, as this system tonight and tomorrow comes out of the Red River Valley of the south and moves toward Illinois and then Michigan, there is the risk on the back side of it of getting a little bit of snow. So right now, the European Ensemble's got a 50 to 70% chance of seeing some snow 
uh, in this corridor. It's going to be a very tough forecast. A 10 to 1 ratio will not work with this given the temperatures. But let's step this up. This is the probability over the next 10 days of getting 3 inches. Let's take it up higher than that here, 6. And now we can start to hone in on those places that really could see quite a bit of snowfall. Now there is a system next week, we talked about it this morning, that could possibly come into Montana and the Western Dakotas. Uh, that one we need to watch the weekend model trends to give you a much more definite picture and I'll do that for you. But right now the heavy snows are here in parts of uh, Saskatchewan, moving into uh, parts of Manitoba, and then in the mountains in the west. And the way that things are set up right now is we could really pile up the snow here. Take a look at this map which shows you the probability of getting a foot of snow. So we see it very high in the Cascades of Sierra Nevada. This is really going to come on early next week. And then also here in the Northern Rockies. And we can just keep going. This is the probability of 18 inches of snow. You know, 100% chance of it right here uh, in the Cascades. And quite high down here in, in parts of the Sierra Nevada. Why not? Let's just go up to two feet. And again, we're going to be adding some pretty serious snowfall. And I like to see this. But when I look at all of this, most of this is coming within the next six to seven days. And what we're going to be watching after that is best seen right here. So jet stream level winds, uh, and we're uh, looking here primarily at what's going on over the Pacific. Now, as I play through the weekend, you can just see, look at the flow just targeting the northwest. That's it. And this is going to dive down into a deeper trough. There it is. And this is going to set us up with just a very active pattern uh, going forward. Now, what I'm curious to see here is that right now, there's a slight breakup in the trade wind pattern, and the MJO has moved over almost into phase eight. Now, we expected it, as I talked about on Monday, to just come right back to phase six. But there's usually about a week lag between when the MJO starts to make its moves and how the jet stream responds. And so what's interesting about this, and we've been hitting at it all week, is that as you go out there to like November the 9th, uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th, the jet stream starts to retract a bit. And what we're seeing here is you notice that coming off of China and Japan and extending just to the south of the Aleutian Islands, these are the fastest winds. But you start to see some splitting flow. See that right there? And that's what's going to actually give the west a bit of a break. But systems are still going to pull through in this direction across the United States and likely run up over some sense of a ridge that maybe extends from the southeast into the open Atlantic. But as I just play this out there farther, the as we approach the middle of the month, the lack of a good jet extension for about a week uh, is, is really showing up here in the models. So that's going to give us a wet week one, but a drier week two for the western United States, especially the Pacific Northwest. I think California is going to see more action than anything. Now, why is all that happening and, and what does it mean? Okay, so uh, here it is. Right now, looking at these Hovmuller diagrams, you see our, our trade wind pattern is a bit of a mess. But it's forecast to come back around the 11th to get back into what we normally see. The strong easterly wind bursts here, and they extend all the way down to the 19th of November, and then the westerlies coming out of the Indian Ocean are back. So it's again back to this, right? If we just draw the line, that means that we expect the MJO to be coming back over toward phase six as we press through the middle of this month, and we see that in the models. So today, it's weekly way over here in uh, phase seven. And over the next couple of days, it's going to quickly curl through phase eight. That's the near-term event that's happening that's going to bust up the Pacific jet like I showed you a moment ago. But you see the, the colored lines here really just take it back over to phase six. And we know, we've looked at this several times, that phase six produces troughs that come off of uh, Japan, troughs in the Gulf of Alaska, and slight ridging here over parts of the central United States and southeast. Now remember, this is a pattern that stays open and moving. It's flowing. There's a lot of uh, you know action like this that sends systems across the United States. So what we want to do is we want to say that, okay, we wet this week. We then see a, a, a bit of a drier pattern starting in the Pacific Northwest next week. Okay, I'm talking in seven-day chunks here too. And then I expect it to all come back again as the MGO returns. So when we look out there at the new long-range data, this is the outlook for um, November 15 to December 15. We still expect to see systems coming into the northwest. No real well-defined subtropical jet yet, but likely following a track that does something like this across the country. And as a result, this area tends to be drier. So if that drought monitor doesn't shrink in size, it would be because we are helping to relieve some drought here, but probably building it in pockets stretching from, you know, maybe Texas, but really into the 
the eastern side of the Mid-South through the Appalachian Mountains into, into the New England. This could be a, just a drier stretch going forward. And we've got kind of multiple ways to support that. We've kind of explained the meteorology of it, but I just want to show you. This has been in the CPC forecast, which was released on Halloween. They're actually seeing a very similar pattern for this month. Now, in a minute, I'm going to talk to you about the temperatures because don't get too used to this, which we're in right now. Uh, with that pattern shift, things are going to start to move around. We'll get to that in a second, but I want to give you a, just a couple more pieces of evidence here. Uh, the first is from the <clears throat> the uh, CSF, CFSV2. So this is their week three forecast, the 18th to the 24th. Do you see it coming back in here again? The above normal precipitation in the west. This is likely going to be too dry as a, of a forecast in this area because systems will likely come in and race through the midsection of the country. I think where it could be dry, I'll kind of put a D on it down here, is in this area. When I say dry, I mean I really just mean drier than normal given the pattern. And this is how things look to finish November and start December. Again, you see if the MJO flips back over to that in, uh, phase six, we'll get the effect of it showing up with above normal precipitation in the west and systems probably coming through the midsection of the country just like this. Why we again see the drier conditions in the southeast of these coasts is because this particular pattern does favor ridging in that area. So we've got CPC, we've got the European model, and we've got the CFSV2 kind of all lining up giving us a similar story. So those are the three big pieces we're looking at. So again, I just want to bring this back. What we're watching for is about 10 days from now, the jet stream to kind of get into this split mode. So you see one piece comes down and the other part goes up. And that's what's going to dry, make things a bit drier in the northwest. It'll still likely bring some systems into California. But you see this trough that's sitting here. This is what's going to finally move some of the colder air that has been anchored over the northwest and British Columbia and the western Canadian prairie and going to move it finally farther to the, uh, to the east. So let's go talk about that. So what we're going to do is we're just going to look at that five-day sliding window. I showed this in my morning report, but I'm going to come back to it again because let's park it right out here uh, on the 9th through the 14th, or really the 8th through the 13th. And at that point, we still are favoring for at least the next 7 to 10 days warmer conditions compared to normal east, uh, but very cold in the west compared to normal. But watch. We're going to start to see that pattern shifting east as the split flow comes in. That's going to reinforce the depth of the trough that's over the Hudson Bay. And then as we get here toward the middle of the month, we do see the colder air coming in. So throughout this week, we've watched the models be quite consistent with this, and it makes sense meteorologically for this to happen while we go through this MJO reset. So I actually kind of like the longer range forecast from the, um, from the European model here, saying that the time period of November 14th through December 14th, or let's actually make it consistent with the other one, the 15th to the 15th there, uh, we, we just see, you know, better chances of bringing in some colder shots of air once we get toward the middle of the month and try to finish this month. Now, um, with that, I do want to make a point here. We know that Europe is very warm right now, and we've talked about that earlier in the week. But with with the pattern shifting around, there will be a this will have an impact on the North Atlantic by putting a big ridge over Iceland. And so the net effect is we now start to see going into the beginning of December colder temperatures showing up across Europe. And that's something we're, we've been very much on the lookout for for a while. All right. Now, tomorrow on Saturday, I will get all new long range weather forecast information from the European model. It always comes out on the fifth of every month. That'll be a seven month forecast. I will be putting that in my Monday reports so that you can uh, see those new maps and kind of get a sense of what's uh, being seen there. And where we'll also spend some time on Monday is what's going on in South America. So went over here to some NDVI mapping. I just want to show you the, the significance of the drought in uh, parts of Argentina. So we clicked on Buenos Aires province. And what we've got here is that still the over the last 20 years, this is the lowest value of uh, NDVI we've seen. If we take off of that and come over here toward Cordoba, again, a major agriculturally productive area. They're well below last year and very close to the bottom you know, part of that distribution of NDVI values over the last 20 years. From there, let's just go over to Santa Fe, this region right in through here, which is along the Parana River. And again, it actually trended down. When I was looking at the latest um, standard precipitation index data, this is from the CHIRPS data set. This is a two-month drought indicator map. Uh, we can we can see how extensive that drought is. And I've tried to verify this by going into the individual station data. For example, this is uh, the station near Buenos Aires. And there has been a few events, but the total precipitation amounts are, are very light. You know, an inch is about, uh, what is it, 30, 30 millimeters. And so we're seeing these values down here at 
10 millimeters. So this is not a whole lot of rainfall. So they continue to have their longer standing drought problems. Uh, coming over here toward Cordoba, let's just click on a station here. And uh, once this resets, there it goes, we see the same issues going on here. So um, there have been a few rainfall events, but look, look at the peak of this. This is around 10 millimeters. So we're not delivering a lot of precipitation. Now, in the near term, it's very dry right now because of the front that cleared through. But the models have been pretty consistent with this small disruption in the MJO, allowing for more systems to start to advance and pull through Argentina. These are just low-pressure systems. And as a result, we get out there into the middle of the month, really starting late next week, and we see better precipitation possibly coming into Argentina and into southern Brazil. We'll have to watch that carefully. Now, the drier conditions that are right now in northern growing areas are not going to slow down planting. This is still, there's still very good, a good setup here for this. But take a look at this. This is my last map for the day. This is showing you the, again, November 15 to December 15 outlook. And uh, because of that return to MJO phase six and the La Nina dominating the pattern, we've gone right back over to above normal rains north, which means this is going to continue or help finish the fast plant in the north, get the soybean crop off very quickly. And then you see down here in southern Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina, the models really just kind of, once again, I, like I've been saying, double down on, on the risk of being drier. So um, that's it. That's that's kind of the bigger picture things I'm watching now ahead of the new release of all the, the long-range data. So uh, Monday, we're going to talk a lot about is La Nina still expected to fade like I think it will once we get you know toward the beginning of the new year. And we'll also be able to see what the European model is thinking about as far as spring. So we'll at least get that, that perspective. I appreciate you giving me an extra day here to get this out to you. Have a good weekend, and we'll talk again on Monday. Thanks.